You know, I just made these bars of soap the last few days. And over the years, I've probably made 5,000 bars of soap. It's basic, simple soap, and I've done it all in this small kitchen. And you know, you could do it too. Now, my inspiration maybe 20 years ago was walking through a little local bookstore and I ran across this pair of books right here. And they are absolutely incredible. So helpful to me, especially this one, The Soap Maker's Companion. The author is Susan Miller Cavett. She's done both The Natural Soap Book and The Soap Maker's Companion. And what I really like are really good illustrations. The layout is really attractive, really approachable. There's all kinds of techniques and recipes for a variety of different soaps. Although, you know, I gotta tell you, all I do is use the most basic recipe and I have tweaked it just a little bit, but it's the recipe that I'm gonna show you today. So, you know, at first, all I wanted to do was make soap for friends and family. And so I made this little wooden box to act as a soap mold. And it made 15 bars of soap, three across and five down. And uh, I'd make two or three of these and call it good. But then, you know, uh, my wife runs a nonprofit. I thought maybe I could sell some soap make bigger batches, help support that nonprofit. And so I scoured the internet, knowing the first thing I had to figure out was how to pour a big block of soap. So I found a design that has this all thread in it, and it allows you to tighten up the mold and then release it at the end. It's lined with freezer paper, and I can put enough goop in here to make 96 bars of soap. After that soap sets up, then I needed a device that would cut it into loaves and then be cut into bars. And this is guitar tuning pegs and piano wire, and it will make 12 evenly shaped loaves by pushing down on the soap. And then finally, after I get those loaves, there needs to be a way to Put a loaf in here and just pretend it's a uh, you know baguette or something or a bunch of bagels and sort of like a cheese cutter on steroids that clinks down and makes eight evenly sized bars of soap now don't worry i'm going to show all of these devices in more detail in separate segments for those of you who might want to make your own but just know there are terrific companies out there that have similar or better solutions than I've made right here. And I got to tell you, I'm really grateful to being able to see what those folks have done. And it really helped inform how I made these. You know, the soap we're going to make today is just basic and it's simple. It doesn't have swirls and colors. It doesn't look like cupcakes, but here's what it's got going for it. It lathers beautifully. It uses all organic ingredients. It doesn't dry out your skin and it smells really good. So this is, this is how we do it. We use these three organic base oils. There's coconut oil, there's palm oil, which is not only organic, but it's sustainably sourced. And there's organic olive oil. And these three get mixed together in a big pot on the stove. And when you heat them up to 80 degrees or a little bit more, they all liquefy together and they become one whole product. Then after the oils are mixed up, these next two ingredients, the sodium hydroxide, which is a caustic powder, commonly known as lye, and water, and I use filtered water. Some people recommend using distilled water. And when I was in Alaska, I would use melted snow. These two go together. You have to take care of this, eye protection, gloves, and this solution, when added to the oils, is what causes the soap process to start. But there are two more ingredients that take the humble bar of soap up a notch, and that is this raw organic honey. And as a former beekeeper, I just uh, have to add that. It really nurtures the skin. And then essential oil is the final thing that's added to the soap goop. And of course the essential oil is 
what gives it its smell and colors it just a little bit too, depending on what type it is. This is clove. I happen to also like lemon and peppermint. Okay, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven ingredients. That's all there is to make really good soap. And of course, we'll have a mountain of coconut oil and a mountain of palm oil and lots more olive oil, etc. because I'll be making two batches of 96 bars each. And so I think it's time that I be quiet and just get ready, measure things out, and you can follow along. I'm starting with the palm oil. Using a digital scale set to pounds and ounces, I carefully weigh out enough for my 96 bar recipe, which is written on the reminder sheet right next to the scale. I do everything twice since I'm making two batches, but remember, even if you're only making a small batch, the process is exactly the same. Next up, coconut oil. I had this stuff stored outside in the cool air, and I practically had to use a hatchet to break it up. Same process, zero out the scale with an empty glass bowl and keep track of the weight carefully. Last but not least is the olive oil, which makes up about 40% of the oils. Each of these three oils, when combined in the right percentages, add their own special qualities to a bar of soap. Olive oil is mild and moisturizing, while both palm and coconut oils help the soap harden and lather beautifully. With everything weighed out, I need to heat up the oils just enough until they liquefy. We're not sauteing here. I'm aiming for between 90 and 100 degrees. If you happen to go past 100, no biggie. You'll just have to allow the goop to cool off before the next steps. You'll notice here that the colors of the two batches are slightly different. The ingredients are exactly the same, but one pot is about 8 degrees hotter than the other one. No problem at all. With the oils ready to go, I can now weigh out the sodium hydroxide. Remember, you need to be careful around this stuff. It is powerfully caustic. And if a few grains of it jumps onto a sweaty or damp patch of skin, it'll burn. That's why I glove up, put on a mask, and protect my eyes. Using my scale, this time set to grams, I once again weigh out enough for each of my two big batches. I'm careful when pouring. I don't want any of these tiny little beads to go dancing around on the countertop or the floor. I also want to make sure to sneak up on the final weight. I want to be right on, especially for this stuff. Oops, I went a few grams over, so I grabbed a spoon and made the correction. Next, the water. I use filtered water, free from contaminants, but distilled water or even soft tap water is fine. I pour it into a clean, heavy-duty plastic bucket, which will withstand the heat and corrosiveness of the lye. You'll want lots of ventilation when mixing the sodium hydroxide with the water. I go outside on the back deck. Now this next step is all about caution. I place my water bucket on a scrap of plywood that protects the deck. Then I relax, take a deep breath, and hold it while smoothly pouring out the sodium hydroxide into the water and then giving the mix a good stir with a clean stick. Stir carefully and don't splash. The goal is to completely dissolve the beads of chemical into the water and it's not difficult to do. Only after moving away do I let out my breath. 
And here you can see how hot the water gets from reacting to the sodium hydroxide. Before I can combine the oils with the lye water, everything needs to be between 80 and 100 degrees. The oils are in that range, but I'll often speed up the cooling process of the lye water by immersing the plastic bucket in cold water and toss in a couple of ice packs. And while the lye water is cooling, I can measure out the honey and essential oils. I don't need to weigh the honey because fortunately I know I need one full 8 ounce jar for each batch. But I do need to weigh out the essential oil, this time with the scale set to milliliters. And yep, I always seem to get some drips on the counter. That's what the brown paper's for. But mmm, love that lemon. And now the mixeroo. Using a clean five gallon bucket, I first dump in the mix of palm, coconut, and olive oils, again making sure they are somewhere between 80 and 100 degrees. Next, the lye water, also between 80 and 100. This is another time to be cautious. Wear gloves and eye protection, and be careful not to splash. Off to the left side you can see the stainless steel paddle mixer thingamajig which I've got attached to an electric drill that is older than most humans. I used to sit by the bucket hand holding the drill for a half hour until my beloved child invented this wooden jig that rests on the rim of the bucket and positions the paddle at just the right depth and location for good mixing. Notice that the shaft of the paddle is not in the very center. Voila! Hands-free mixing and a little swivel action to boot. When the oils mix with the lye, a process called saponification happens. The mixture heats up and starts thickening, and after about a half hour I check for what's called tracing, where a thread of soap stays on the surface before sinking back in. This looks just right, and I know it's a good time for me to add the honey. If you choose not to include honey in your recipe, this would also be the right time to add your essential oil or other kind of scent. After adding the honey, and again after adding the essential oil, I make sure to mix thoroughly, maybe 30 seconds or so, to be sure everything is incorporated. Now, of course, I'm making big batches using big buckets and a drill, but I started out making 15 bar batches in a regular KitchenAid mixer. There's nothing wrong with that for sure, and if you're a beginning soap maker, that's what I would recommend. When the mixing's done, I spin the excess off the paddle by raising it just above the surface and hitting the accelerator. Finally, time to pour. I've lined the mold with freezer paper, which protects the wood surfaces, and I'll make sure to show you how I fold and secure that lining paper in another segment. No big tricks here. I'm just trying not to slop the goop onto the floor or onto the edges of the mold. The biggest hassle is cradling the bucket while spatulating the remainder into the mold. A little bit of rock and roll to even out the surface and then I can look forward to cleaning up my bucket. To keep the heat in and any debris out, I cover the mold with some plastic sheets. After 36 to 48 hours, the soap is set up enough for me to use my fancy slicers and dicers to cut the big block into loaves and bars. All I have to do is slightly loosen up the quarter inch all thread rods that hold the mold tightly together. Then I curl back the tabs of tape that held the freezer paper from shifting around and pull the mold off. 
Since the freezer paper is actually in two parts, a bottom liner and a side liner, I start by removing the bottom. I have to carefully tip the block over to uncover the base, peeling away both the paper and the tape that holds the two parts together. The soap is still quite soft, so I'm careful not to leave dents in the sides. After the bottom liner is off, I reposition the block carefully on its wooden base. That'll be important when I use the loaf cutter. Then I work my way around, pulling the liner free from the sides of the block. You can see a few marks in the soap here, caused by the liner not being perfectly flat. But once the soap is sliced into bars, those will hardly be noticeable. And after all, it's handmade soap. Now for the fun. I made this loaf cutter to match the size of the big block, and I spaced the piano wire to make 12 2 and a quarter inch by 3 inch rectangles, my preferred size of a bar of soap. I've made sure to adjust the tuning pegs so that these wires are tight and cut straight as I push down evenly. A few years ago, one of the wires broke halfway down, leaving behind some terrific soap samples. The loaves are fully cut when the wires bottom out in the grooves sawn into the wood base. Ah, the moment of truth. These are loaves of lemon, and they feel and look just right. And now some loaves of clove. Here you can see those grooves in the wooden bottom of the mold that allow the wire to go all the way down through the soap. All I have left to do is slice the loaves into individual bars of soap. Gone are the days when I used to do this with a kitchen knife. Just like any fine instrument, these wires need to be adjusted occasionally, and I just turn the tuning pegs until each wire is approximately the same pitch. Each loaf gives me eight full bars of soap, one and a quarter inches thick, with a leftover piece that I can use in our home or cut up into cute little sample bars. With 12 loaves, that means I can get 96 full bars per big block. Here's a close-up, nice and slow. You can see how well these thin wires cut the soap. This was indeed a game changer for me. Not only are the bars good looking, but being the same size means that the labeling and packaging goes smoothly. The trays I put the soap on are baking sheets from Costco and cost under $5 each. I can space out 32 bars on each tray, so I use three trays for each big block. And of course, no YouTube video can be complete without a speed em up section. out here in the warm corner of my woodworking shop where I have the drying trays for the soap. They have to dry for four to six weeks before they're fully cured and ready to be labeled. And I've got two racks, each will hold 12 trays of soap. Now, I've tried my best to show you step by step how to make this good simple soap, but I know there's plenty of questions you have like, where does he get all his oils and essential oils and sodium hydroxide and supplies for making this soap? You'll see links for those in the description. Or maybe he showed these things, but he didn't tell us how to make it. The mold, the slicer, the loaf cutter. There's a separate video for those where I'll give you dimensions 
and I'll tell you how I put on the pegs and the wires. Or maybe something as simple as, okay, we saw the freezer paper in that mold, but how do you cut it and fold it and put it in? I gotta tell you, it seems simple, but it took me about three years to figure that one out. I still don't have it perfect. And maybe even something as simple as, okay, you got the soap, but what do you do for a label? Well, I've got these, I designed these labels and I even designed a cool little bender thingamajig that folds the labels. And I'll make a really short little video that shows you how to do that. Okay, well, if you got any other questions, here's where you go. This book, I'm not getting a kickback for this. They don't even know I exist. But this book I found 15 or 20 years ago, and it's got so much good information and lots of recipes. And if you want to do shampoo and bath salts and that sort of thing, you'll find it in this book. So there's a link for that. Now, if you've appreciated what you've seen, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because there's a lot more coming. I'm going to put this soap away. Thanks a lot for watching.